I'm going to read some things and then I'll get into the main part of the message. Some of these things perhaps are things that some of you have heard before, that I have said before, but for the sake of where it is going, where the gospel is going anymore, I think sometimes it's necessary to bring some of these things into some of these messages that are being heard freshly in other countries and across the globe. So I would like to start my message today in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. So God help me. <clears throat> and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. We want to take notice. I want to take notice of several things in the beginning part of the message. And <clears throat> I would like to say that we want to look at what the tempter has spoken in the Bible. Now, we don't read a whole lot of what the tempter has spoken. We read a lot about what he's doing and what he has done. But when you want to hear the words of something coming out of somebody, you want to hear what he said. This is why I was so deeply moved when I heard that God actually said Moses' name. He said Moses and Noah's name. And there are several others that he mentioned their name. And it brought tears to me even to know that even God, even a holy God, would use a human name and name somebody. I was so moved by that. And when I look at, and I'll say this, the biggest, the biggest individuals, and it's a lack of the right word, it's not an individual, but, and I don't want to call them gods, but I do know God is Jehovah and he is God. But when I look at the biggest powers in the world, God is number one. But we also do know in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit lies the same power. So if I could say this, that in the Godhead, there lies the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's the most powerful of all powers. But we do also recognize that there is another power that has brought more damage to their power than any of them, and this is the power of the tempter, the power of Satan. And so when we hear and we look at the, the powerful words that are spoken by the most powerful out there, I inquire to know what did they say, why did they say what they did. And so what God spoke, he spoke to us all this. And in this, we are, have recorded in some record of where the tempter has spoken, where actually Satan the devil, the fallen angel, has actually spoken. And I want to look at some of those words and identify them to bring us into the message of the fall of man. So I read this again in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Notice something. At a time when Jesus was hungry. He was really hungry. He had fasted close to 40 days here. He was really hungry. And in that most moment of deep hunger, here comes the tempter and says, you can change that stone into bread. We also notice in the Garden of Eden, which I'll get to a little bit later, in the Garden of Eden, it was at the time when Eve was hungry. She was standing at a tree, and she was hungry. She wanted to eat something, and the tempter came. You see, I believe that the tempter will come to you when you're most hungry after what you're hungry for. Even if it's food. Even if it's lust. Even if it's any other thing in your life. He will come to you at that moment of that which you like the most. And that's where he tries to speak and tempt. We'll speak a little bit more about that a little bit later. Now it says in verse 4, <clears throat> remember the first thing, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details about, about why he said what he did, but we will just identify it a little bit. It says, if thou be the Son of God, and I had to make a diversion today in this message by making a decision whether I should speak more about the fall of a holy angel 
that has fallen out of the heavens, right out of the presence of God. A third of heaven's holy angels fell right away from the very presence of God. Right in his holiness. We see glimpses of his holiness, but they made a choice to fall away, and it was based on the same fall that was with Eve. Same fall. And if I could go back and identify it, bring it down to here, you could see that, but I chose to not go into that, but rather speak some other things. I believe that probably deserves a message on its own. Jesus' answer to the direct, to the direct words of Satan, and I want you to hear this. I believe most people miss this. There's many people that want to just rebuke Satan. They want to just tell him to go, tell him to go, tell him to go. Jesus gave a word. And I want you to see the words that he gave. The words that most people wouldn't even think about repeating. Verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Out of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, just a simple quote that God was speaking and he made this reference concerning Israel. This is the reason they went through 40 days or 40 years in the wilderness, so that they would learn to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I thought it was to Israel. It's the only place that you read this up until this time, until he says it and repeats it. I, you know, our natural man, I don't want to say I thought. I don't want to say that because I didn't. I believe God showed me this. But it is our natural man that just wants to look at that little quote that was given back there, the reason that the children of Israel wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years was simply because God wanted to teach them to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now Jesus uses that very word in this vulnerable moment, and he throws it right back at the enemy, and he says, man shall not live by bread only. There is no other place in the Bible that I found that to say. He goes back to the book of Deuteronomy, and he repeats to the enemy, the tempter, I'm not supposed to eat bread only, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He says this, Matthew chapter 4, <clears throat> actually, you know what I'm going to do? Just to make a point, I'm going to turn to Psalms 91, I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's a beautiful chapter, but I want to read the whole chapter to make one point. <clears throat> he that dwelleth in the secret of the place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress and my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. And He shall cover thee with the feathers and under His wings shall thou trust. His truth, or His truth, shall be thy shield and bugler. And thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night and the arrow that flieth by day. Now this was David sitting out on the hillsides down in the area of En Gedi, the way I understand. In fact, it's the same area as you see when you walk in and in the front of the foyer. But you see that long, tall picture. That's the En Gedi. That's the waterfalls at En Gedi. Obviously, it was this place where David was, where there was the only place of water in that territory. And so he chose as running away from Saul and trying to protect himself from Saul because Saul was after his life. And in this, he wrote a lot of psalms. And so here he writes, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the air that flieth by the day. This is Old Testament. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall thou purge any, any plague, sorry, come nigh thy dwelling. For he, shall give thee, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They, they shall bear thee up in, the hands, in their hands, Lest thou dash thy stone against the, or thy foot against the stone, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shall thou tremble under feet, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him, I will set him up on high. 
because he has known my way, verse 15, and shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. How many of you have looked at this chapter down through the years and have said it's a marvelous chapter, you've been moved by it, and you've used it at times? I want to read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. And saith unto him, I continue, I, I'm not doing, I'm just taking some verses out to bring my point and then we'll get to the main part of the message. And saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, remember now here again is the tempter. The tempter again is tempting Jesus because Jesus is hungry and he is alone and he is, he is fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and he's led by the spirit to do so. And if he says here, the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. Satan, the enemy, came with the very word that David wrote right down, was about 18 miles from where this was spoken, where this was written, is where Jesus was being tempted. In fact, more uh, continue, uh, scholars continue to believe that where Jesus went in his fast for 40 days and 40 nights was down in the Engedi area as well. So perhaps the words were written right in the very territory that even Jesus was at here. But what you want to see here that Satan reached into the book of Psalms chapter 91 and took chapter, uh, verse 11 and threw it at the face of Jesus. After he took him 18 miles up onto the pinnacle of the temple, he said, Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off. You can do this. You won't hurt yourself. Because in David wrote in Psalms that he will give his angels charge over you. Let's look at the response of Jesus. Verse 10, then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I skipped one. Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, I've got something a little mixed up here. Let me see here. Yes, I, I mixed up the next portion. I'm sorry. I, I got to verse 9 before I got to verse 6. This was talking about the temple that he took um, uh, Jesus to the temple in verse 9. And then is when Satan quoted this. Now I have to go back because of that mistake. I'll go back to Matthew chapter 4 verse 6 and it says, And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his... Was I right? I was right. I'm sorry. Now I was wrong. <laughs> okay. Now I'll look at verse 9. And saith unto him, All these things, he took him up to an exceeding high mountain. Yes, that's right. He took him up on an exceeding high mountain. The exceeding high mountain in that area, there's only one that has snow caps year round, and that is Mount Hermon. This was the same place that is known to be where the Mount of Transfiguration was. And he took him up on the exceeding high mountain, and he said, all these things, he made him look around, all these things. Now, when you look at that, I, I could spend so much more detail going into this because when you look east, you see Syria. When you look, and you look all the way from where Abraham started over in Babylon, over in Iraq known today, and he saw all basically on top of Mount Hermon, could basically see all the history of where the Bible was written. And he looked across there, every path that Jesus will ever affect and, and, and walk in while he was alive, they could pretty much see from that high mountain. And he looked around, he looked, looked to Syria, and looked over into the way distance into Egypt. You could see perhaps on a clear day, I believe spiritually perhaps he saw all that. And maybe he saw around the whole globe, and he saw the sea of, actually Mount Hermon is right over here. This is actually a picture of, a little bit to the left of right here is Mount Hermon. And so he, and this is the Sea of Galilee. So he looked that whole area where he did all those miracles to be not yet done. And Satan offered him, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all this. Well, it's interesting to know something. That in the very beginning, it was, I believe I spoke about this last Sunday, that, that man, Adam and Eve, were given dominion over the fall of, this, uh, fall of the air, 
anything in the air. They were given dominion, but now they've lost it because of the fall. And now Satan is saying, I will give it to you because obviously he knew he had it. Satan knew that he had that dominion now. And then he said to Jesus, Jesus, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you everything that you see around me. And this is where Jesus said, and now he goes back. Let me see verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou worship. Well, where do you read this? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him. It was simply just an old command that was kind of relatively written in the Bible, perhaps. Same as it was written about David while he was penning down something there in En Gedi. Same as what was quoted about Israel concerning bread. Perhaps not a very important verse. Now, I'm not saying that. I believe they're all important. But the way that nominal Christianity will look at these verses, not just these, but I just picked three of them out that were really kind of ignored by a lot of people. And perhaps some of you sitting here have never even seen those verses. And they were the number one defense that Jesus turned to in his most crucial moment up to that time. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus knew the word. Somehow he knew this word. He must have studied the word. He must have had the word. And at the moment where it seems that you could say anything else but turn to a couple little verses that really bear no real importance to my life at this moment because I live in the New Testament. Jesus being the creator of bringing us into the new covenant turns to these massive verses that are so forgotten. And he uses it as his number one defense. And as I look at the success of Christ not yielding to the temptation that Satan gave, I have to conclude he used the perfect verses at that moment. In complete defense for the entrance of the new covenant that was now on the verge of being broken by Satan yielding to a temptation or not. By Satan or by Jesus yielding to a temptation from Satan or not. By him doing something that he could easily do and that is to make bread out of a stone. He could easily do that but the wrong commander was giving the orders. And there's the difference. Now I want to turn to the main part of the message. I use that somewhat of an I use that somewhat of an introduction to what I want to speak about concerning Adam and Eve. I want to talk about the fall of Adam and Eve and what I believe and I put much prayer and I put much thought in this message. Some of the quotes that you're going to hear me say are not quotes that I didn't think deep into before I decided that I can use them. As I was praying and in prayer, the Lord showed me some things. And many times he does that. I come to the end where I don't know which way to turn on a message. And then I go, I have to find it on my knees again. And then he'll show me things. And the thoughts that I'm going to share, some of them sound like, oh my, I'm not sure about that. You're saying it too quickly. No, no. This has been pre-thought. It's been prayed over. And I believe God showed me it's the way it is. But it's probably things that you've never heard. You see, church, sometimes you might wonder, why do I speak so much on the deeper things of God? I get to preach salvation messages Sunday after Sunday, but you're not there. You're deeper. God wants to take you deeper into his kingdom. He wants to take you in so deep that you cannot reach the ground anymore with your feet. Not just up to the angle, not to the knees, not to your ways, but he wants to take you in that you're suspended in the water of his word by faith. 
And I believe this is the need of the hour to take people deeper into his kingdom. And this, I believe, is clear why God is giving me messages of, of depth to you people. Because he wants to take you deeper. You say like this, well, when, right when I got born again, wasn't that good enough? Look at the little baby that's sitting on your lap. Is that good enough? Or if they don't come to be my age, is that not God's intention? Do we say to a little baby that doesn't grow, there's something wrong? Do we say to a little baby that when they stay in the crib and drink milk all their life, that there's an issue? We don't even question that. I believe many times we go to our, our doctors and we ask the doctors to fix things in these little babies when things are wrong. But we often don't see that in our own life, perhaps as little babies. We don't go to the doctor, but we see there's something wrong. I see there's something wrong in my life, but I'm not turning to the doctor to fix it. I'm learning to be content to lay in the crib. I'm learning to be content to just drink milk all my life. That's not the church that God wants. It's not the church that he speaks to in the book of Revelation. And so, I believe God has his intention to take you deeper. And I will say this also, that many of you are going deeper with God. Many of you are walking in a place you've never walked before. And I believe it's in preparation to what's coming. God will have his church, and he will have his glory and he will have his maturity in the church. And he will wean you from milk. And he will give you meat. And meat is really what makes you grow. That milk that sustained you so strongly and made those little fat cheeks on that little healthy baby was so good for it, but it can never bring you to the age of 57. It wouldn't work. And so milk is something that God gives, but it is designed to be graduated from. So we go deeper and eat of his meat so that we experience, like Sister Ann said, in fact, she didn't say it, she texted it to me, that I'm experiencing some things in faith. And I wish I could quote that text correctly. I'm seeing something happen that never happened before. I'm seeing all at once that God is doing the work. If I take my fingers off. I'm seeing the power of God doing the work rather than me putting the sweat into it. But me just believing and walking in that confidence that he is the one that will do all things. You see, until you discover the greatest thing about yourself, you will never be able to do much in your Christian life. Want me to repeat that again? I want you to hear this. Unless you discover the greatest thing in your life that you can ever have, unless you discover what that greatest thing is in your life, you will never go far in your Christian life. Do you know what that greatest thing is? It's your weakness. The church in the world, the church around the world, and the carnal man, often, he tries to take his strength to take him deeper with God. Paul said it doesn't work that way. When I'm weak, I'm strong. If you can discover that the greatest thing that you have going for your life is your weakness, only then will you rely on the strength of God, and only then can God walk in you. You see, God walks in your weakness. Your pride walks in your strength. And I will show you numerous places today in the Bible where this is repeated, where you can see it's the Scripture. Paul learned it when he said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I'm weak, then he is strong. But when I'm strong... Can't help me. 
And I believe that for the end time church and the revival that is taking place and will take place, people need to learn to walk in their weakness. People need to learn to walk in the weakness that they have and let God overtake that so that they could have strength in the power of God. And then when you have that, you will stand back and you say, it wasn't me. Until you can say it wasn't me, it was you. And to bring you to that point of where you cannot say it wasn't me, or it was me, to bring you to that point takes you to a complete place of dependence. A complete place of dependence on faith. For I can do nothing except Christ that works in me. I don't want to get ahead of the message, but I want to continue. You see, you shall only look for strength in the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, 29. The strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. All the strength of Israel was not in them getting their heads together. All the strength in Israel was not to have the military trained completely correct. All the strength, because at times God used, as God worked through Israel by faith, the people destroyed themselves. The army destroyed themselves. Some places the water came from the heavens. On a clear day, God would open the heavens and pour out rain and rain and rain and rain and thunder and lightning until the the Hazarites or the Philistines were completely dissolved and they never got to fight. Matthew chapter 8, 29, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with this, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before time? Satan at one place, and I always, I don't like to use his name. Today I have to more than the typical message I would use. I like to call him just the enemy or the tempter. Because I do believe that he delights if we use his name. Jesus does if we use his. If we use the name of Jesus, something happens. So I like to call him the enemy. But when we look at this, it was earlier that the tempter came to Jesus and he said, If thou be the Son of God. Now here we see in Matthew chapter 8, he turns around those same spirits, turns around and confessed that he is the Son of God. Something happened of a recognition that took place between the wilderness and between this part right here where the gathering demoniac came, the two of them, I believe, came out of the tombs and people even dreaded walking past, but they came out of the tombs and there they would gnash at people. They couldn't even keep clothes on them. And here they saw Jesus coming and they come out and they started confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. Even the enemy started confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. And today, may it be known in all the heavenlies that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. I confess that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the great, glorious God. He is the only God and there is none greater. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the healer. He is the one that redeems people from lives of destruction. And he is the one that forgives sins. He is the one that cleanses people's lives. He is the Son of God. I confess that to to you this day and to everybody across the whole world that Jesus is the answer. He is the Son of God. Truly he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. Yes, he is the Messiah. Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua, for all those of you watching in Israel, which I do understand there's an audience, quite an audience, Yeshua HaMashiach, my understanding is that means the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Messiah, I confess that. Well, there's something 
Now, I won't go into that yet. But let's look at some more things here, and then we'll go to that. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. Above it, above it talking about the, in the Holy of Holies, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. It's talking about worship. You see, it talks about the seraphims that were really close into the presence of God. They dwell there symbolically and I believe also eternally. There is this presence that rests alongside the presence of God somehow. As we read in several places in the Old Testament and we get glimpses of it in the New Testament and we read about it in the book of Revelation that there is seraphims and where they spend their ministry and what they did is they spent themselves in the presence of God and they had six wings with two wings. What do you think of when I say wings? Fly. When you think of wings, you think of flying. It says the seraphims had two wings. Two wings covered their face. When you come into the holiness of God, when you come into the presence of God, that's what happens. Have you ever been in the presence of God where you just want to go like this? That's what happens. This is how they worship, two wings. And the other were the two on top of their feet. They recognized that they could not walk. They recognized that he was too holy. And in his presence of his holiness, they couldn't even walk. So they covered. They took that which would normally fly him and transport, transport him and do all the work and make him do things. They used to cover their walk and their face. And only then can you use the other two to fly. Many of us, if we were to start covering our faces in worship to God and to cover our feet, but rather than that, we try to use all six and to keep flying and we're never able to fly because you will not fly when your feet are not covered because they will walk. And I'm saying these things and some of these things might not make much sense to you, but they will as we go on. People, we need to learn that you cannot walk the Christian life. You cannot live outside of Christ. The Bible says only if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so those feet need to be covered. Your walk needs to be covered. It needs that which easily could fly you in places perhaps needs to stop that walking and to stay in the presence of God only then will those other two wings carry you and cause you to fly. If you don't do this, my friend, what will happen? All through your life, you will just go through a life and you will never be able to fly. You will only walk. And that walking is often in the flesh. You want to come in the presence of true worship. And listen, I'm not done yet. Don't form opinions before I'm done. Because you'll open your eyes to what God's wanting to show you. You say, well, what do I do? I don't, just listen. We're not there yet. Many people are not willing to put the wings, that which would be able to make them do something and cover their feet because they have to hold still. And if they hold still, they feel like they're doing nothing. And when they're doing nothing, they just, they, they have this, thing that Cain had. I've got to do something. I've got to raise fruit. I, I have to raise corn. I have to do something so that God would smile on my life. Not the seraphims in the presence of God. They covered their feet and they covered their face and with two they didn't fly. In my understanding without going deeper into it, 
is unless you cover your face, tells me you're not in the presence of God. Perhaps because you don't cover your face, you have the faces of man looking at you, and it scares you, and fear of man rules your life. You would serve God deeper, but you're afraid what people say. Cover your face. If you don't cover your face, you're able to see everything that goes out there with your natural eye. And the Bible says that when Jesus will come, he will not judge by what he sees. And in true worship, I believe in true worship, we cover our eyes. We cover what all is over our face, and I believe part of it is the ears. Jesus said, when he will come, the Bible said, when he will come, he will not look with his eyes or judge with his eyes, nor will he judge of what he hears. Look at this, my friend. How many times has you as a carnal person walked around having the wings off of your feet and not your wings over your, over your eyes or over your ears and you've gone out and you've formed opinions based on something you've heard or something you've seen. And then you spread around and walk around and do it perhaps with your feet. You will only do the will of God you will only work the depth of God. You will only work in the power of God. You will only see the demonstration of the Spirit of God if you cover your feet and keep your face covered. It is only then that you'll walk and that you'll be able to fly like an eagle that never tires because it's effortless. Its wings will just soar you. And the winds, the upwinds and the updrafts will hold you. Who is the wind? He is the Holy Spirit. You'll be able to fly with your wings and glide divinely by the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead, you'll be able to glide on that. This is where you'll see power. This is where you'll see the power of God. This is where many refuse to walk because there's a cross to get there. Luke, I want to go back now and start with a message on the fall of man. Luke chapter 3 verse 38. Which was the son of Enos? Which was the son of Seth? which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Do you know that the Bible is very clear right there that Adam was the son of God? Are you aware of that? Adam was the son of God. That's what it says. Adam was the son of God. Now Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Eve was hungry. She was in need of food. There was the serpent. There was the tempter. At that moment that you're needing food, at that moment that you're coming into his presence and saying, Oh God, God, I need this. God, I have this need. That's when the tempter is often speaking. And he will give you some advice. And he will offer you some sort of other strength. And you can turn to it. Eve looked at it. And I'm going to say something that I, I'm pretty sure none of you ever heard. I never heard it. Never heard it say. Never heard it said or anything. A lot of these comments I haven't. But I believe I have scriptural foundation for it. You see, I used to preach many years ago. I used to say that Eve sinned first by talking to the serpent. Well, there's no scriptural basis for that, so I was wrong. The only scriptural basis in law that Eve actually had, Adam and Eve at this point, is do not touch the tree and do not eat of it. It's a tree of knowledge. So it doesn't say that she could not have communicated because remember, they had dominion over the fall of the, the fall of the air. 
and over the fish of the sea and everything that creeps upon the earth. They had total control and total power and dominion over everything. And that included the serpent. And even if something speaks out of the serpent's mouth, they had dominion over that. So that means to me that they would have certainly spoken to them. So where did they fall and where did Eve fall? When I saw this some time ago, I would just long to see it have an effect on your heart, the way it affected my heart. When I saw this, I fell on my face. I, I'm not telling you that so that you know, but this is how much it affected me. When I saw at once the reason that Eve yielded, I believe all Eve wanted, I believe she wanted to give something to God that came from herself. Because all this while, she had to lean on God. She had to walk in the strength of God. She longed to have something that she could give and say, God, are you happy with what I can give you now? A pat on her back. Because all the strength that she had in this point all came from God. It all came from a relationship with God. It all came from fellowship with God. Because Eve, as Adam, Adam was a son of God. He was a son of God. He had no sin in his life. Eve had no sin. Nothing was any sin in them. So they were thinking the same way that the other son of God that we read about in the Bible in, in uh, first or Second Corinthians, where it talks about the last Adam, the first man Adam, uh, first uh, man Adam, which is uh, first. The first Adam, which was Adam, or the first man was Adam. The second man, which is the last man, was Jesus, it says, if I can say it right. And one was of the flesh, another one was of the spirit. But I believe what Eve longed for was exactly the same longing that you and I naturally have in our lives. And that is that I could somehow give something to God so that he would be happy with me. Why do I always have to depend that he gives me something, then I give it back? Can I not produce something that he could smile on my life? Listen, my friend, that's your biggest struggle. I do not know of a bigger struggle in life than wanting to please God from the own things I produce. And I believe it came as a direct result of the original fall. That is most prevalent in a God-conscious person. Is I want to do something for God. I want to do something, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to do something for God. But it's the fountain where it comes from is where the issue lies. And so Eve, here she is. She's looking at that tree, and she's looking at that. And, and she had no intention to eat, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe No, she didn't. Because she had to be convinced. And so the serpent spoke. And so did God say you cannot eat of this tree? He said, yeah, God did. He said, well, he knows that you're going to be like God's to know good and evil. You see, if we know good and evil, if I would just know good and evil, I could offer something to him. I could make a decision to do good. Is this right or is this wrong? If I could just do that up until that time, I don't think they had that because all they had was good. But if I could make the choice on my own, what I think is good and what I think is bad, I could offer something to him, and I would be like, God. And so I believe the original thought that Eve had when she stood at that tree was the wonderings, perhaps, that the enemy saw as she wandered around the garden, eating from tree to tree. And then she was hungry all at once, and as all at once she was wondering, just all oh, this pleasantness of having fellowship with God. This is so awesome. And it was obvious that the voice of God was right with her. The voice of God was right in her because after she sinned, it says the voice came walking before it was not walking. Because the voice within her. There was sweet fellowship. There was sweet truth. There was eternal life written all over her. She had that. It was bliss. It was awesome. There was no scar of sin. There was nothing even repentant in her. There was nothing even 
of any scars of any past sin or anything that somebody ever wounded or hurt or even spoke bad words about her. Nothing. Nothing. She was completely clear. She was so clean. And isn't it in the nature what you think of man to, to say, God, this is so awesome. Can I give you something back? And she was doing it. Under the power of God. But God put it in her and she gave it back. And it's acceptable to God. But she wanted something more. God, can I never come to a place where I can please you one day? How many of you said that? Part of the original fall. God, can I never come to a place where I can tell you I've, I've sinned here. And I will tell you, God, I will never do it again. See, you're making the decision of good and evil. Because you have the knowledge of it. God, I will never do this again, have you? Is that where it stopped? You're still doing it. You did it again. You did it again. You did it again. Until the strength and the power of God sets you free from it. It is within the confines of human nature, in human ability, in the fallen nature of man, lies this absolute truth. And it's not Bible truth necessarily, but it's fact. And that is that we want to do something for a higher being that we respect and honor. It started in the garden. She was doing it and God fully accepted it. But Eve just, but God, you're always dumping water on my head, then I give you a cup back. Then you're watering a head on my life, then I give you a cup back. Then you're and then I give back. Is there any way that I could start doing, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to have your strength making me do this. I want to do something to make you pleased just by what I can do. And the wife bakes the special cake for the husband that comes home. And makes the special food for the husband that comes home. And the, and the husband does that special little something for the wife so that Oh, thank you. That was thoughtful. Who did it? I did it. Because I thought of you. Because I love you. That's why I did it. And in that nature, you will always also have that. God, can I do something special for you? Can I somehow bless you, God? If nothing else, I want to prove to you that I love you. If nothing else, I want to prove to you, God. I'm your child, and I will do everything for you. I believe that's part of the fall of what attracted Eve to that tree. If I could get a hold of something that would please God. Something. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last man, Adam, a quickening spirit. Verse 46, howbeit that which was first, which is spiritual, but that which is not spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. Caesarea, a great city over in Israel, on the west coast, out in the Mediterranean Sea, was actually given as a kind of a waste city into the hands of Herod. And Herod went and turned this thing over and made it a beautiful city. And it is a fantastic city if you walk in it. It's amazing the work that went into this. There's stuff I could talk about and I will not because of time. And it's just simply some facts of the phenomenal place that was built already several thousand years ago. With technology that was completely missing to what we have today. Taking Stones and concrete, which there was no concrete, but forming something that was like concrete that is still standing to this day several thousand years later in water 200 feet and deeper. A tremendous work of man. And Herod did this to give it back to Caesar to impress him. This is what I can do. This is what I did. I did this for you, Caesar. You're a wonderful person, and I want you to just get this as a gift. And he showed his strength in that.
You see, I do not believe that Adam and Eve at this point had any violation of sin before they ate. So there was this thing in them that they, they definitely wanted to please God. I just truly believe that. They wanted to tr please God, but they want to do it on something where they don't have to depend on Him. How many of you have ever come to a place of being tired of depending on God? You know you have. You go through temptations and you make a failure in your life and you say to God, God, I'm going to show you that I can get above this and not do it again. Rather than coming to him in what true worship is, falling flat on your face and saying, God, without you, I can do nothing. I have come to an absolute place in my life, in my personal life, and I have come here, I have God has brought me here to a place that I am absolutely convinced that I can do nothing outside the strength of God. I know that. I have come to that place. This is why before we come and, and have a message, this is why before we preach on the radio or wherever it is, whatever is being, do, being done in the name of God, why we fall and are laying on our faces and weeping before God for hours sometimes and at night time sometimes and not having a message, having nothing to give because it's a choice we make in being completely dependent on Him. You walk a life of faith. It's the only thing you'll walk by. It's one thing to say, God, you help me now. And then we pick up our feet and continue. There's another thing to say, God, I'm not, it's not possible for me to do this. I cannot. And the other thing, the last thing that I want to do, in fact, I, hear, I say this to, to the Lord all the time. Lord, because I consider preaching very hard work and the preparation of preaching extremely hard work. And I don't want to waste one minute or one second in studying the Word and preaching the Word if you will not get glory from it by way of demonstration of His Spirit. I don't want to hear the words, that's a good message. It wasn't me. It didn't come from me. I don't even have the inspiration for it. It's part of laying before Him and resigning our feet with the wings that could fly normally. And now they don't fly. They're covered. God, I can't go. God, I have nothing. I have nothing to give. I can't even live the Christian life by myself. It's alone in the cross. This is why I understand where Paul said, I have nothing to delight in. I have nothing that I can glory in. Save one thing, the cross. You know why? Because it works. It's my only hope. It's my only place. I go on that cross. I lay on the cross. And I say, God, I die here. And the resurrection is up to you. It's not me. Oh, many do not understand the cross. They do not understand the cross. Many of them think it's just some little thing of testifying to a neighbor. Or some other little piece of maybe cloth or a pair of shoes to wear or not to wear. It's not that. The cross is much deeper than that because it is life-changing every time. It is every time. It is life-changing. You raise from the dead when you truly die. You don't walk around with a sad face. The cross doesn't offer that. The cross offers resurrection power and tremendous demonstration of the Holy Spirit. That's what the cross does. And until we learn the cross and we, need, and, and, and we understand the power of the cross in full surrender, in full submission, and covering the feet and covering the face and saying, God, I can, I cannot go on. I cannot fulfill this task. It is too big. Even the smallest thing at times comes to, brings us to a place where we totally rely on God. And it's only His strength, even in our work, everything. Everything. Only then can the power of God come and you can use the other two wings. Some of you are experiencing that. You know what I'm talking about. All at once God's doing things that you're not even touching. All at once God is blessing you. All at once God is answering prayers you never prayed for. Why? He's working. 
He's doing it. This is where Eve was, but she wanted to walk. Because now the carnal man's nature is that somehow, remember this, my friend. I really hope you can remember this. I really hope that even more than memory, that it would go into your heart that you could see all the times that you have spoken to God and said, God, please, please, God, help me not to do this again because I'm ashamed of myself. We consider that as being a horrible thing, but rather than that, there is a greater violation, and God, we're shaming you because we walk in our own ability, and in that we fail. That is proven to be an ultimate failure. We walk in the surrender of Christ, and in that surrender is where he picks us up, and that's where we go, and we soar like the eagle. What is true worship? Some say it's the lifting of hands as we sing. When you study worship in the Bible, every last time it has to do with your body. It's a posture. The best way I can describe with much study, diligent study, I should say even extremely diligent study, in seeking God what truly is worship, I conclude as well as other men have in the past, Conclude that worship is flat on your face before God saying, I'm done. That's worship. It's one of those key words that the Bible, gave, that God gave to me through the Holy Spirit this right after New Year's in Proverbs where it says, commit your works unto the Lord and he will establish your thoughts. Lord, today, I cannot sing. Lord, I cannot, I cannot go up there in front of the people. I commit those works to you. Establish my thinking. Lord, I cannot preach today. I cannot go up there and preach. Oh, God, I, I can. But I commit the works to you. And now he writes the thoughts in my mind and in my heart. And here they come. And he shows me things. That's worship. I believe worship, remember what I said earlier in another message where I said the man, I believe it was a ruler, came to Jesus and he worshiped him saying, my son is dead or my daughter is dead. How can you worship Jesus saying, my daughter is dead or my son is dead? You know how? When Mary Magdalene and uh, Martha came to Jesus and sent for him, Jesus come, Lazarus is dead. They worshipped him because they turned to the higher source of power. They surrendered themselves as if it's impossible for me to raise them up. So they turned to who? Jesus. And when you turn to Jesus in that mighty hour when you are dead in him, he will raise you from the dead. This is when things start happening. It's glorious. It's absolutely glorious. Jeremiah 13, verse 11, for as the girdle, before I say that, let me look at a couple of little notes I have here. Uh, I'll just read some things. I think, I'm talking about Eve now, I think she wanted to serve God without leaning so hard on him. She also, I intend to think that she wanted to please God with, her, with herself and her own strength. I also think she only wanted to please God with more of her own and not dependent so much on God. People, I'm 57 years old. I've been a pastor for 27 years that I've been preaching the gospel. I've been preaching the gospel longer than that. Don't tell me you don't have that problem. I've had that problem for all these 27 years. Until I came, until God put me, took me down and down and down to where I saw that there is no other hope anywhere except in the strength of God. Some of you look at yourself being completely defeated. You'll never be able to stand up and somehow show God that, that what you're doing is acceptable to him. You are correct, my friend. You're right on, 100%. That's the way it is. You will never please him with your good works. That's what Cain tried to do. And Abel brought something that cost a life. God said, I accept that. Listen to me. That's the gospel. 
We tell it to the one that isn't born again. We tell the one that is not born again. If you would just quit trying and give it to God, you could be born again. You could be changed. But after we become born again, we pick it back up and want to prove to God that we can. We catch ourselves saying it beforehand, but no. We walk in the very thing that we recommend to others. The glory of the cross. People think the cross is a sad thing. It's the greatest deliverance I have ever had in my life. The cross is the greatest success I have ever experienced in my life. It's my place of surrender. It's my place of where it stops and where it starts. It's the place of where my heart beat the last time and his heart beat the first time. And it happens every day. God wants you to walk that way so it pleases him. Jeremiah, let me see here. I wrote this down. I think I've quoted it already without reading it, but I'll, put, I'll, I'll read it. After all, how can you give God something if he has to give it to you first? That's the human mentality. I cannot give something to God because he gave it to me. Do you know why he gave it to you? So you can give it back to him. That's what glorifies him. Because many cannot do that. And you have to be spiritual to do that. Oh, if you could get a hold of that truth. He says this in Jeremiah 13 and verse 11. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel, the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not. He said like a, like a, a piece of cloth, like a loin cloth, like my clothes are hanging on me. Everything is right here. Everything is wrapped up. You are within your clothes. He says that's how he wanted Israel to be and Judah to be, but they wouldn't hear. God longs for you to cling unto him like a tight loincloth. Something really tight, God, I have to have you. I cannot do without you. Where you go, I have to go. I go with you because I'm wrapped tightly around you. And, and this was their salvation. But God says, but they did not hear him. How many times have you tried to hang on to God and you think, oh, what is he thinking? That I cannot walk on my own? That's right. That's why he sent Jesus. He sent him first for that, that salvation. Think of it. When you're wrapped tightly around him and it's the only thing you can hang on, you know who's getting glory? All him. He loves that. I remember in the days when I had little children and the young, younger children, I always loved when I held them and they put their arm around my, kind of like my neck and helped me tight. How many of you remember those? You like that? That is special. That is special. You have that, it's like, it's a trust. They're trusting me and they're loving the trust in me. That's how Jesus wants us to cling unto him. You hang on to him. Because it's eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. This is how he longs for you to be with him. You'll never please him on your own. You won't. He doesn't want that. It's called unrighteousness. You see, it's, it's also, it's called faith. And you know, when you have faith, when you walk the walk of faith, it's humility. See, the problem with us, we're so proud in our own nature we think we can do something that makes God smile. I think I can do something. You know what? You want to make God smile by way of pleasing him? There's only one way. I don't know of any other way in the Bible except one way to please him. That's by faith. Without faith, you cannot please him. And faith, whew, what is that? It's a deep humility of surrender, of saying, God, I can't. I will depend on you to do it. And if, even if God doesn't move, I still depend on it. That little child hangs on to me hard even if I stand still. I can stand for one hour and it'll hang on to me. But when I walk, I go right with, that child goes right with me. That's faith. Faith. It's 
humility and its grace. Many people do not have that grace where they can depend on God's faith or the faith to carry them. If you eat of the tree of knowledge, you will know what is good and evil. Now, since you know what is good and evil, you can make your own decision. And you'll say, I have people coming to me having the tree of knowledge in full bloom within them and say, do you think this is right or is it wrong? That's knowledge. Is it right or is it wrong? I have a better way of understanding that. Is it the word? If it's not, then it's not of God. Because we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jeremiah 13, 11 again. The garment of praise, I changed some words a little bit. The garment of praise is to lift up the trials and victories of your present and your past into the worship before Almighty God. So he had called Israel and Judah to cling to him like a loincloth for the praise and glory, but they would not. And you know, because they didn't do that, he sent them into a prison. That's a waiting message that I will preach someday here. The mystery of Babylon, God's prison house. People that do not walk in that are going to go back into the captivity for 70 years as a type and shadow in the Old Testament. Goes right into the controls of Babylon. Who is Babylon? It's the world. And that world will start intriguing you and interesting you and you'll find yourself behind bars in it and you can't get out from it because you would not trust God. Because you wouldn't trust him to carry you to be your works. It is God that is your works. It is God that is your faith. It is God that is your love. He is the sole fountain of everything. He is the eternal life. He is the spring of life. He is the healer. He is everything that's God. Jeremiah 31, 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplication will I lead them. And I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. How, how many of you have wept before God? You've cried, oh God, Lord, this is so hard. He said, that's what will happen. Nothing wrong with that. Let me read that again now. You should, you should follow that. This is, this is a tremendous good verse. Hear it. They shall come with weeping. You will come with weeping. And with supplication, the word supplication means strong crying. You will come and say, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. God, I need you. I need your help. God, I need you. Oh Lord, oh, I failed. I have, oh God, I'm desperate. God, I'm desperate. He says this about the people of God. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk. In that moment of God. God, I fail. Forgive me, Lord. I lean on you. I surrender. I give it all. He calls that walking right next to a straight river. And until you're spiritual, you will not get it that way. The carnal man will certainly confirm in his heart at this point that God has turned himself to be his enemy. And he questions the very nature of God and his love because of the power within the strength of a carnal man. Let me just read that again one more time. It's so sweet. They shall come with weeping and with strong crying. Will I lead them? How many of you have been led? How was it done? Have you cried out to him, God, I need you to lead me. God, I can't walk. God, I'm not sure what you want me to do here. God, I just don't know. Lord, I don't know. He says, that's how he'll lead you. The strong crying. I will cause them to walk by the wa rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. Luke 1, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I want to wrap it up here soon. With God, nothing shall be impossible. John 5, verse 19, all the way uh, to verse 30, but not reading every verse. 
Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son of Man can do nothing. The Son of Man can do nothing. Jesus can do nothing. But what, what he sees the Father do, for what things soever he does, these also doeth the Son likewise. Verse 20, for the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doth or doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Verse 21, for as the Father raises the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Verse 22, for the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. If the Father judges no man, and it committed all judgment unto the Son, and the Bible says when the Son will come, he will not judge by what he sees and what he hears. So what judgment does he use? Certainly not ours. Because ours is wrong. Verse 30. I can of mine own self, Jesus. Listen, my friends. Listen. Listen to this truth. Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own way. I do not seek that which makes me feel good. Or I do not seek that which diverts around certain people. Or I do not seek that which makes me acceptable to certain people. I seek to do your will and I seek to do that with delight. But of the will of the Father which has sent me. John 8, verse 28. The singers, when I get ready, I'll, we'll be done here in a little bit. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. Jesus said, I would like to go through the aisle, and I would like to tap you on your head, every last one of you, so that you could have the attention of this word. Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. Do you have any understanding by way of experience what that is? You see, sometimes I believe God needs to throw something in front of you so difficult, so huge, so large that you will come to the grips that you cannot do it. Until he has you convinced that even the slightest and smallest things you cannot do. Some of you have some huge things in front of you and it's in front of you, and you're still fighting it, still trying to grab it with your fist, and grab it, and finagle, and strategize, and, and do things somehow to get a hold of the thing, and get it by the horns, so that it obeys you. But it's that fist man, the flesh man, the natural man. I believe many times God lays giants right in your face. It could be your family. It could be your neighbor. It could be an employer or an employee. Somebody that is a giant right in your face. That you're trying so hard not to sin in their presence. You're, so, you're trying so hard to somehow read through their heart. But they see all your mistakes. And you'll tell yourself, until I come to a place where I don't make me these mistakes, I cannot witness to them. God is asking you to surrender at the power of the cross and give up at the power of the cross and see that the task that is waiting in front of you is there for one thing, and that is to undermine you and to make you fall flat on your face, lest you will always trust in your own strength. And if God has mercy on us, he will chasten us in this way. And he calls it chastening. And chastening hurts. It doesn't feel good. But you know what it does? It's the love of God. His arm is telling you there's a better way. There's a way you can fly like an eagle. But you've been walking and you've been stumping and you've been kicking around in the dirt. 
way of faith is a very deep walk. There's some of you, there's some of you that you cannot overcome where you've been in. You cannot undo what has been done. There's only one plane flat on your face. That's called worship. Imagine the whole world on their face. People, we expect it of the world, but we don't want to do it ourselves. Imagine if I would tell you tomorrow morning around 7 o'clock around the whole world, everyone will be on their face crying out to God. There would be instant revival. We can tell them to do it, but we don't want to do it. Because we can. It's a life of faith. The fall of man longs to please God by its own strength. And revival is when that all quits and gives up. Then God will start. Amen. Furthermore, God, you know you cannot heal anyone. You know you cannot revive anyone. Your arm means nothing. Only a little band-aid. What people need is deliverance. What people need is exactly what Jesus brought when he came. Declaring liberty to the captives. Proclamation of his own faith. Deliverance, healing, truth, repentance. And Jesus said, even the power of the Son of God that was sinless, had no sin in him, even said, he cannot do it on his own. And the good news behind this whole message is, my dearly beloved friends, can I say it again? My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, Right here and wherever you are. The good news is you can't. The better news is he did. Hallelujah. And he said he couldn't outside the father. And I say I can't without the son. This is why we have so many people in the past, but it's coming, it's changing, that it, people have been so hard against the Holy Spirit because they put a certain label on a certain part of the Spirit and it offended. What did it offend? Their carnal nature. We need the Holy Spirit in this last time because that's the resurrection of Christ. Maybe several more verses here then I'm finished. John Chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. We can read it that. Oh, that's a favorite chapter for many people not understanding what it really says. It's easy to read that. It's easy to memorize it. Like I've said before, many people look through the threshold of some of these truths, and they marvel at it. And they know it inside out, but they've never walked through the threshold. They're standing outside the door looking in and going, wow, look at that. Understand it and might have a perfect message on it, but have not walked through the threshold. You see what's happening is, what's happening with these messages is we're going to see people sitting in this audience. Some of you are sitting in here and you've had private struggles and nobody knows about it. That's what you think. God knows and the Holy Spirit knows. And when the Holy Spirit knows, he will certainly show it. Some of you go through struggles that you think you're in it. You can say amen. You can say hallelujah. You can raise your hand. You can do all those things. You can smile. You can say all the right things. But you have a problem. And you're somehow in your life, you're wanting to somehow show God and the people too that you're a godly man or a godly woman because you always have concerns by what you see and hear. can be assured it's not from Jesus when that's where judgment comes from let's look at it again I'm the vine you're the branches he that abideth in me and I in him it's twofold I abide in him he abides in me and it says the same bringeth forth much fruit 
because without me you can do nothing. Now, I don't know if I have, I don't know if there is, I, I don't know if there is any way that I can explain that truth about coming to a place of faith. Some people understand that quitting all their work, laying flat down, stopping doing everything. Well, if that's what God demands, I guess, or asks of you, that's, that's between you and him. That's the least. The most is your selfish efforts that I will do some great thing for God. Or somewhere, something, I'm going to do this. I'm, I will somehow make God smile on me. And after he smiles on me, and then the people will smile on me. And I will be a blessed man because of what the people say. Friend, all I know, as far as I know as I can go, is I can go to the cross, and I've never been led any further than that. I've not been able to walk past the cross. Now, some of you might question this by me stopping with that, with that comment saying, what about resurrection? That's what I found there. But then it's him. That's the wings. It's no more I am my walking. That's where the wings come. We understand. We understand. We go to the cross. We surrender. Let, me get, let you in a little bit on my life. Every morning, one of the first things you'll find me do while most people are sleeping, laying flat on the floor up in my room, saying, God, every task that lies in front of me, unless you do it, I'm done. And it's not a habit. That's the way I feel about it. I'm not a capable man. Listen, my friend, in the fifth grade, I flunked the fifth grade. I had 27 Fs in the fifth grade. I was a stupid man. I was a dumb man. Until I was empowered by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, my life revolutionized and his wisdom spilled over me. I'm a changed man completely after that. But that's where I lay. When you stand up behind the mic and you try to preach one message over the radio 20 times and you quit every time because you cannot go on. And yet God hears you crying, Lord, make me a spiritual man. Make so that I can do nothing outside your strength. And then he flops you and flops you and flops you and flops you and flops you, and flops you on one 13-minute message. For 20 times until finally all you can do is preach the message from off of your knees. Then you know that you've come to a place where you can do not even this. And then finally at that one place when God was dealing with me in this. And finally at that one place I finally, God I think I can now do it after surrender, surrender. And listen to this, amusing it might be, after I thought I can do it, where I can stand up and at least, Lord, if you tarry with me and somehow help me and assist me, that I can start and not just make mistakes. Because I'd start in, then I make a mistake. I start in, then I make a mistake. And so I'd get on my knees and finally, God gave me enough courage, with, just open your mouth and I will fill it. And so I stood and next thing that happens, I was... 10 minutes and 30 some seconds, which take 13 some minutes to do a message. And then the UPS driver drove in and he went beep, beep. And that was recorded. So I had to rearrange the whole thing, go right back, start over. And the same day, that same moment after I got up and I did it again, here comes uh, United States Postal Service, the mailman, and knocked on the door, put a beep, beep. They wanted something signed, the package they delivered. I was the only one in the house. I didn't want to go down. I was recording. I was in the midst of this spiritual battle that I could not do. And once God gave me enough courage that I finally saw that, you know what, I'm just going to, and I just surrender. And this is the way I live. This is the way it is every time. Not 20 failures like that. But God, I just cannot go on. I'm a man that loves to work on the outside. I'm a man that loves to work. 
I've always loved to work. I've worked diligently. I've established many things that most people don't even consider in our day. Wouldn't do it. I did it. And I loved it and I loved it and loved it. And God shut me down and says, from now, it will be full time. And I sit there the first year, and one of my favorite things that I love is the outside and running heavy equipment. I look out the, out the window, and I see the heavy equipment running across the field. And I just, oh, I mean, that's, that, it was crucifying every sound I heard. And there's sometimes I stood in front of that window and literally cried. God, I just want to be on the outside. I want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be in here. I don't want to study. I don't want to write in this book anymore. I'm writing books, and I'm, I'm tired of it. God, I can't even think anymore. And then I had sinusitis on top of it, yet it was a night. It was a night in my life. Until I heard the whisper. When you talked to me some years ago, you told me to lead you in a life of faith. And then I could stand with a smile. Was it me? It was him. That's what the cross does. It settles that in your life. It stops that in your life. That inner motion, the motions of the flesh, the things that you think you have to do. Some of you are struggling perhaps in your family. You're struggling financially. Surrender it to Christ. Give it up to Christ. Lay it before him and tell him, God, I can't do. Because there's times when it seems that now I'm starting to and then here I get a hospital bill. Oh no, then I have a doctor bill. And then something else goes wrong. And then I have an accident. Sometimes God with his angels sets some master thing too big to master right in front of you to share a message with you in faith that you long to walk in. Amen. Because he loves you. He chastens every son whom he loves and he doesn't chasten you, he doesn't love you. He chastens every son and he doesn't do it in an unkind way. He just gets the message across. He wants you on his lap. He wants you to praise him. And you know who him is? The word. You hang on to that word. It's the only promise. 3,573 uh, promises in the Bible. In the Bible, 3,000 some. That's in him. He wants you to hang on to those. Some say as much as 7,000 promises. He lives in you by the promises. Why did Eve not want this? Oh, I remember that day when God showed me Ishmael. And I, lay, I was lying on the floor and I was saying, God, faith is so hard because I can't touch it and I can't see it. And he flashed it through my mind. Oh, that Ishmael might live. Oh, that I could let my own product do the work. Oh, that I could let my own fingers find acceptance with him. Oh, that Ishmael might live. 99 years old, laying in the dust and saying, Oh, God, God, I see you're saying faith. I see, but, but, I, but I can do it. And Abraham could. Abraham could do it. He could reproduce. He reproduced an Ishmael. He just could not do it through Sarah. Who's your Sarah? That's a message. I can basically tell you who Sarah is. Because after the Holy Ghost came on Sarah, the I went away and the H was put in. The I is your Sarah. <laughs> oh Lord, I, I want so much that people hear this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. Once you can say that all things I can do come from God, then you know he's strengthened you. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. 
so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We want to make this gospel so hard. You might say, Wayne, I don't know that I can go back and remember everything you said. No, cross. Remember what I said some months ago? The cross is not hard. It's the flesh that is hard. The cross is not hard. It's just a place to surrender. But the flesh is so hard because there's no fighting in the cross. The fighting is in the flesh. What is the simplicity of the gospel? It is this. You cannot serve God by your own strength. You have to depend on him. That's simple. God bless you.